What's your take on Mr. Michael Landon? Well, Michael, like any great guy, um, he's complicated. You know, you don't get to a place like Michael Landon's fame without having a lot of things happen in your life. One of the great things about Michael back in the 70s, which all great artists have, is to be able to take your trauma and make it something teachable. And so he was able to take that and these stories that Little House were based on and infuse his own type of morality into it. Good, you know, golden rule. Be how Treat people how you'd like to be treated. What's up, everybody? This is indeed the E-Man channel. I like the villain singer, like Bob Dylan. Keep it on the low with some double stuff. Oh, yes. Hi. Today is going to be a special treat today, man. You know, I've, I, on, on the podcast, I've expressed many times how much I love movies. You can see the movie poster behind me. Um, And this gentleman is a veteran, a true veteran of the entertainment industry. Um, this actor slash writer slash producer has has been at it since the 70s, right? Um, he started off on um he played Andrew Garvey or Andy Garvey on Little House on the Perry. Then fast forward a little bit, he had a few TV spots for John and D, uh Starsky and Hutch, and so so many more. Um and on the big silver screen, he was in Heather's. Uh, he was in this movie, um, the classic movie Summer School. And my favorite movie, he played the dangerous but lovable Fester in Three Ninjas. Not to mention, he he, he does voice acting as well. He was um, Flash Thompson in the 90s hit cartoon uh, Spider-Man. And um, I'm so happy, I'm so honored to have on the show. Mr. Patrick Laberto on the special delivery show. How are you doing today, Patrick? How are you doing? <laughs> hey man, thanks for having me. I'm very, I'm very happy to be here. Maybe we can sweep this whole thing up, right? Like <laughs> it'd be kind of rewind. <laughs> oh my gosh. Do you like this? Do you like that movie? I thought it was great. Gondry did a great job. I thought it was an amazing movie. Yes, sir. Um now I want to make sure because I looked on Internet Movie Database, make sure I'm pronouncing your last thing right. Laberto. Perfect. Okay, fantastic. Because I was no no. Because I <laughs> I've messed up a lot of la I've messed up a few last names on the show. I just want to make sure I'm saying it right. So, um, how are things in the beautiful city of Angels, Los Angeles? How are things? There's great. There's no fires. There's no floods. So far, no earthquakes, and so it's gorgeous. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Now, with my show, I always always like to start off with the childhood because i believe that's a very foundational thing you know you know we we, we build our dreams when we we're a kid so i wanted to know like what movie or tv show truly knocked your socks off where you were like oh my gosh this is this is amazing i have to be an actor well first of all i'm so much older than you i don't know if you'll know any of the references but and, and i started off acting my mom was an actor so okay. my mom would take us, my brother and I, to auditions with her. So there really wasn't a moment where I decided to be an actor. It just sort of happened. But uh, the biggest uh, entertainment moment in my life is Star Wars. I saw it at the Chinese uh, the week it opened, and I was just blown away. And I just I, I fell in love with making movies in that movie, even though I had been in a ton of stuff. Um, and I had worked by that time I'd worked with, you know, Mel Brooks and Blazing Saddles and uh, nice. Lucille Ball and MAME. And so it's like I had all these huge experiences, but Star Wars was like uh, at the time in 77 was brand new and it, it felt like my movie. You know, I, I just couldn't get over it. I had to see it over and over and over again. Man, let me tell you something um, for me. I always say this on the, on, the, on the podcast. I say Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom changed my life. But nice choice. Everyone's Thank down you. on that movie. It's a good movie. Thank you so much for saying because it's like I know Spielberg got a lot of flat for it because it was so gory and violent. But that to me, that's the thing that blew my mind because in our household, you know, 
we didn't watch a lot of horror movies and that movie has mm -hmm. a lot of horror elements and right. I mean, and I didn't even see Raiders of the Lost Ark. The only reason I wanted to see that movie is because of Harrison Ford. And so, like, when I watched that movie and I'm like, oh, my God, you know, ripping out of the heart and the bugs. I mean, it just blew my mind. But um, Return of the Jedi was, like, my first Star Wars experience in a movie theater. And what can I say, man? You know, yeah. it was amazing. Yeah. yeah, I have two great line waiting stories in for Temple of Doom, uh, originally I went to go see uh, Return of the Jedi down in Hollywood at the Egyptian, and I waited in line to go see it, and it was like one of these, the first times, like big lines where you would camp mm -hmm. out. And I was like the fourth person in line, and I met all these people that I really fell you know, in love with. They were really great. I had a great time at that movie, and then my buddy and I waited in line in Westwood for Temple of Doom. And we were the first in line over there at Westwood. And we actually got on back when they had newspapers. Uh, we were on the front page of the newspaper of like, hey, look oh. at these idiots waiting in line for Temple of Doom. But I love Temple of Doom. I think Short Round's a freaking great character. And his yes. relationship with Indy is fantastic. I would have loved to have seen him come back in the last movie. That would have been really fun. I, I was hoping that would happen too, but a shout out to Jonathan Keyquan for winning an Oscar after being dormant for like 20 something yeah. years. He's doing okay. Oh, yeah. Um, now, listen, I'm going to be 100% honest with you, Patrick. And I, I, I like to keep it real on my show. Yeah. Little House on the Prairie, as a kid, I couldn't stand it. My sister, on the other hand. Yeah, I get you. Huh? I get it, man. I just did a TikTok <laughs> where I'm talking like, everyone says Little House is this great family show, but everything bad that could happen to a person in the world happened on that show it was a very dramatic show and i think yeah. people remember it mainly because most of the women that come up to me watched it with their moms or their grandmas okay mm. most of the guys who watched it was in a house of sisters and moms and that's yeah, yeah. why they watched it so it's like yeah i get it i watched little house and i was a big fan but it was because back in the time because you're what about 20 how old are you you're you're a young kid Oh no no I'm um I'm for, I'm forty I'm for oh, okay one <laughs> but even then you weren't watching it live on on in the in the seventies right oh no um I think I think they had reruns coming on in the eighties because that's that's yeah exactly so but but back in the seventies there were like three channels okay and these right. three channels that was the only thing you could watch there was no cable there was no videotape and Little House was the only one that had kids on it and so that's why I watched it. But I, I totally took over what you were saying. I'm sorry. You 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 weren't such a big Little House wasn't such a big deal, which I get. It, it it was I wasn't a big fan of it, but my sister, shout out to my sister Tatisha. Hey, how are you doing? She absolutely loved it. So when I called her and I said, Listen, um, I'm gonna be interviewing one of the actors from Little House on a Perry. And I said, I've never asked her this question. I said, What was it about that show that had you glued to the TV? I mean, she would watch it from beginning to end. And she said, mm -hmm. um, she said, I related to Laura, Laura Ingalls. I love the strong Christian values that was, you know, that uh, the show portrayed as right. well as like she was a fan of Michael Landon, you know. And um, she said that Laura, Laura was an innocent character, but her world wasn't so innocent. And she kind of discovered that throughout the whole show. And I was like, oh, OK. And I have not watched it. I have not rewatched it. And maybe I will have a different take as an adult. But as a kid, I didn't like it. But I wanted to know. Um, and my sister and I was talking about this. Can you say hello to my sister, Tartisha? How do you, what's your name? Tartisha. Hey, Tartisha. Patrick Laverto played Andy Garvey. Wanted to say hey to you. How you doing? Thank you so much. She's gonna, she's gonna <laughs> love that. And I talked about this, and I was saying, she was saying like Michael Landon had like a reputation, um, for being a hard worker. You know, uh, I think uh, in one of your stories, you said that sometimes he would like when he would show would end he would be writing the next show you yeah. know um but there was also a, another rumor that he wasn't a very nice man but then other people say he was great what, were, what was your take on mr michael landon well michael like any great guy um he, he's complicated you know you don't get to a place like michael landon's fame without having a lot of things happen in your life now i'm not saying anything that hasn't been made public or that people don't know but he did this movie uh uh, a TV movie that was about his childhood called Samson, which is he, his mom 
would he would wet the bed and his mom would put his his sheets out on the front lawn to embarrass him and mm -hmm. so after school he would run home as fast as he could to get the sheets down and bring the sheets down well because he was running so fast and he got really fast at running he joined the track team and that got him a scholarship at sc and then he was like in athletics at usc which got him into hollywood and got him into Bonanza, got him into Little House. So it's like, it's all this connected tissue, but at the very core of it is this huge trauma, right? And I think right. that one of the great things about Michael back in the seventies, which all great artists have, is to be able to take your trauma and make it something teachable. And so he was able to take that and these stories that Little House were based on and infuse his own type of morality into it. And his morality was very basic moral understandings. Be good, you know, golden rule. Be how Treat people how you'd like to be treated. Amen, and so yes. because there's not really any politics or, you know, agenda there, just like want, just be good people, he was able to do a lot of stuff. I mean, he, he shouted out like racism and bigotry and anti-Semitism all on Little House in the time when no one else was talking about it. And no one could touch him because all he was saying was just be nice to another person. And so that I think was great. Now, I'm not Michael Landon's family. Michael Landon um, had issues with different, he got married three times. Uh, he ended up marrying a woman while we were on the show who was also working on the show. And he had a wife that he got divorced with while he was on the show. So those are all personal things, which of course I can't speak to. And I would imagine that there was a lot of personal turmoil for him, which, you know, there was an episode where my family, the Garveys, were going through a divorce. And it was at the time that he was getting divorced. So it's like, you know that he's writing about these things. But in answer to your question, on the set, Michael was the ultimate ruler. He was a, he was a dictator with a heart of gold. He knew what he wanted, and so it was very, very easy to work there because there was only one boss. There's only one guy telling you, hey, this is what I'd like. He's writing the show. He's directing the show. He's starring in the show. You earn his respect because he's the best actor, the best writer, and the best director there. So you don't have any problem working with someone who is that accomplished. Then take all of that away because we show respect. Then he's just a really funny guy. He was really funny, which not a lot of people got to see on Little House. He was humorous here and there, but he was a really, really funny guy. And he was also one of these guys, I don't know if you've run into him, where when you're inside their bubble, you feel really special. He's really a great guy. He makes you feel really, really special. And that's how Michael was. You just felt really special and really cool when you were around him. And you didn't want to disappoint him. And when he was upset, he was righteously upset, meaning that he was right. He was correct about being upset. There was a scene where the only time I heard him yell was, I think Melissa was having her very first kiss with the guy who plays her husband on the show. And everyone was nervous. You know, Melissa's nervous. The guy she's kissing is nervous. Michael's raised this girl. It's like his daughter. Everyone's nervous. And these little handheld computer games had just come out. And they're shooting the scene, and one of them on the stage beeped uh -oh. and kind of the shot, and he screamed and screamed, and he was so upset, and it was terrifying to hear him scream like that. Yeah. But he was right. Like, what is that effing Game Boy doing here? It wasn't a Game Boy, <laughs> but whatever it was. Video game doing here. Get him off the set. Get the person off the set. And so, yeah, he had the full spectrum of emotions. But what gained everyone's respect was he never quit working. You know, mm. before computers, he was writing the scripts on a yellow pad and giving them to a secretary who would then type them up. And he would write on the way to work. He had a driver that drove him in a, a station wagon. So not like a limousine or anything, just a station wagon. He'd write, he'd write on the way home. And then when we were at the studio and we were shooting the inside sets during his lunch hour, back then we had an hour, during the lunch hour, he would go to the edit room and he would edit the episodes and do all that. He never stopped working. Wow. So I, I love the man. He inspired me. I mean, Little House for sure taught me every, not everything, but taught me the basics of everything about how to make a movie and how to do a movie. And I wanted to make 
movies at that point. But then when I saw Star Wars, I was like, oh, that, I, I get that. I can do that. Or, I mean, I can't do that, but I want to do that type of thing. Right. Well, now, just to go back a little bit, because when you had said, when you asked me how old I was, yeah. you said, because a phone call, you know how those 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 crazy phone calls come in, those robo calls, and so I did, thank you. That was the best compliment I got in this year. You said, oh, you thought I was twenty. Thank you so much. I'm about to be forty seven. See, I had I can't even keep up with it anymore. Oh damn, so, you're yeah. old. Yes, yes, <laughs> I, I'm up there, sir. <laughs> so yeah, um, actually around the eighties and the nineties, you know, Los Angeles and New York are like some of the biggest entertainment meccas. You know, when you're trying to make your way through the industry. So you've been doing this since you were a kid. Now, are you able now to still watch a movie, still watch a TV show and and get lost in it? Or, you know, are you just, uh, you know, it's you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, it's kind of like, you know, when you worked at McDonald's for a long time, you know, you don't want to eat the cheeseburgers anymore. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't so, I mean, spoil my cheeseburgers. I love me my cheeseburgers. But yeah, <laughs> no, if, if it's a good movie, absolutely. If it's a good TV show, Absolutely. If it's a bad movie, like really, really, really bad, and I've done bad movies, I've, and not <laughs> long ago, I've done really bad movies. Um, when it's a bad movie, some of the only entertainment I get out of it is looking at it, trying to figure out their schedule. Like if you look at a movie and you go, oh, I've seen this set five times. They must have had that set. They probably were there for two days. They were probably were on this location for a day. And so, yeah, that kind of comes into play. But if you're watching a movie where I'm, you know, you're being entertained, like I love I I I fall into those worlds faster than anybody. What's the last good movie you watched? Do you like recently? Uh, okay, good 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 question. Um you know what? I just saw for the first time uh His Girl Friday with Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell. And I've been really trying to like watch some of the older movies that I haven't been educated on. Okay. And that was the last Movie, yeah, that was literally the, not the last movie I saw. I just I, I just rewatched Dune, which was amazing because I'm seeing the new one, uh, you know, oh, uh, cool. this, this coming weekend, and that's amazing. But the last first time I saw a good movie, last you know, first viewing of it was a movie called His Girl Friday, which if you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. His Girl Friday, okay, yeah, I've never Karen seen Grant that. and Rosalind Russell. It's about this divorced couple who are also newspaper reporters. And she comes by his work to tell him that, you know, she's getting married and he tries to trick her to stay and, and steal her away from the guy because he's still in love with her. And it's really, it's wonderful. And what's so weird about these movies, it's a black and white movie. It's shot in the thirties. You think, oh, I'm never going to be able to connect with it. Right. But it, I take away the black and white part of it, the acting and the characters and their dialogue. And it's, it's known to be one of the fastest spoken movies like I think at one point they have 300 words per minute in the dialogue. You know, it's a very, very stylized type of of speech. It's just fantastic. So I would recommend it to anybody. Okay. But I'm gonna have to check that out. The last good movie I watched in the movie theater, at least, uh, uh -huh. I watched Godzilla Minus One. Oh, I um, wanted to see that. Was it is it good? Oh, yes. Very okay. good. I wanted to, okay. I just got we we have to talk about three ninjas. <laughs> Because, <laughs> look, I think nostalgia and, and, and it gets a bad rap, man. People were like, oh, you're just tripping off of the nostalgia. I had a really heavy argument with a young lady and who was like, you know, she was saying that the 90s Turtles movie, which is like one of my favorite movies, she said, oh, it's not as good. You're just tripping off of the nostalgia. I'm like, well, whatever, you're wrong. There's a lot of things in this world that's trying to steal your joy. But if something makes you smile, no matter what it is, it's a good thing. You know what I mean? And yeah. so with you. Well, and it's your opinion. There's she you can't she can't have she can't have an opinion about your opinion, but your opinion's still factual. That's right. That's right. And so with three ninjas, man, I mean I remember I actually remember watching it in the theater. Now, when it came out, I don't even think I watched the trailer. I just know that, you know, my sister was like, There's this movie called Three Ninjas. Do you want to see it? I'm like, okay, sure. And I remember going to the movie theater and I was like, Okay, I gotta look at the poster at least. And mm -hmm. I just love those colors. They remind me of um the colors kind of gave me like a sorbet ice cream color, yeah, you know. Uh -huh. vibe. Yep. And I was like, okay, this is gonna be cool. And man, I I dude, I can't even count the number of times I rented that movie from Blockbuster Video, man. 
like <laughs> so like I, I and it was like i would watch it just for certain parts you know what i'm saying but now nowadays you could just type it in on youtube and if you want to see your favorite part but um right. movies directed by john turtle tub starring the late great victor wong yes. max elliott slade uh michael trentor chad power and yours truly so <laughs> i have to know how did you get the role of fester uh, that's a great question because it was uh, they they sent me most of the time. I've I, most of the time you get a call from your agent and they send you out on an audition. They just say, "Hey, go read for this at this time," and so that's where it started. But this time they also said, "You know, there's a script available. Do you want to read the script?" And there was no email back then, so you had to go and get the script. So I went to the agency. I read the script, and to me, it's, it seemed like a pretty straightforward assignment. It, it was Home Alone and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, basically. Mm -hmm. And so I understood what I was supposed to be doing as far as the, the character. And they did describe them as kind of surfer burnout guys. And I had been doing um, an improv. I was in an improv company and I was doing basically my version of Spicoli from Fast Times, you know, the surfer guy. And I went in and I read with John and John Turtletop, who's now this huge, huge director from National Treasure and, you know, uh, the the Meg. This was like, I think his third movie. He had directed um, a German movie and a movie with the Barbarian Brothers, which were these two bodybuilding twin guys who were hysterical. And I know then exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know the Barbarian Brothers? Yeah, yeah, yeah I know exactly. Yeah. I know what movie you're talking about, yes. Yeah, so... Um, at the time the movie was called ninja kids and so we were reading for ninja kids and i just remember getting along with john we we're about the same age we got along we had the same type of humor and he was really impressed with my resume because i had done a movie with uh, john casavetes who's like this independent 70s filmmaker and he, later on i would find out that he felt intimidated by you know the fact that i was working with john casavetes Although he, you know, obviously there's nothing there to be intimidated by. So anyways, they hired me and I get to the set and I run into another guy there. We're coming out of our trailer at the same time. And I go, the, I said, Hey, uh, what part are you playing? He goes, I'm playing Fester. And I go, Oh, I thought I was playing Fester. And he goes, no, I'm John's friend. I'm going to play Fester. And I'm like, Oh no, I thought I was playing Fester. Maybe I'm playing hammer the other. Cause there's only another, there's three surfers, but only two of them talk. The other guy just says, dude. Right. <laughs> So I'm like, well, please let me be playing Hammer because I don't want to be playing the dude guy. So I go to John and John goes, no, you're Fester. And I go, well, this other guy thinks he's Fester. He talks to the guy. The guy quits. Like, and that's our first day of shooting. So they don't have wow. a guy playing Hammer. And I'm, my brother's an actor. And I was like saying, hey, maybe we can get my brother out here. And they go, yeah, maybe we'll just shoot around Hammer until we cast a new guy. And then the second assistant cameraman, who was this great looking guy with long hair, about the same age as us, he comes over and he goes, I think I can do it. <laughs> and then John's like, do what? He goes, I think I can play Hammer. And they said, well, let's use you as like a body double for whoever we're going to hire for today, right? And so the first shot, the first scene that we did was in when we take over the liquor store and we and we are you know we get on the phone call and so if you look in the liquor store there's only one shot where all three of us are together and then there's one close up of the guy that's playing hammer a guy named DJ Harder and then right. the guy who played the dude surfer was a guy named Race Nelson and so Race and DJ were there but only Race and I were on the counter because they didn't want to have DJ there in case they didn't find a guy that looked enough like him or whatever. Anyways, he was so good that they just ended up, he ended up being the guy playing Hammer. And it's one of my favorite stories because it's like such a Hollywood story out of nowhere. You know, it's like, I'll do it. I can do it. And he was hysterical. Wow. So so at that moment, he probably got his SAG membership and everything, right? Because he, you know, because yep. he had, wow. That's yeah. crazy. Um, Okay. I, I want to ask your opinion on something because I like I have these lines that you that you say that have been burnt into my brain, and I, I want to know what your opinion as far as like uh, my impression of Fester. <laughs> I can't <laughs> believe I'm doing this. Okay, um, Mr. Muffin Man, catch you later. <laughs> was that improvised? No, that was actually in the uh, 
Uh, actually, no, it was, but it was given to me by John Turtletop. It was like, he goes, I don't know, say goodbye to your muffin. And so I said, uh, Mr. Muffin Man, see you later. And then that's how that got in. Oh, my God. Those little dudes are ours. And then you say, Slurpee? <laughs> now, I didn't provide the, the Slurpee part because, you know. No, that was, like all, that was all scripted. Wow. 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 Incredible. Like, well, uh, now I, I saw on your Instagram that you said, <laughs> this is so, this is hilarious. Like the scene when uh, Rocky played by Michael, when he took those, <laughs> those neckties, roped them around your neck, he was, and he was really hitting you hard. You know what I mean? And, 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 yeah. and, um, <laughs> and I, I, I was like, that, that, that's definitely true because I remember the part where he like, you know, jumps over the banister and he drags you and like he's climbing up your neck and you're turning like beet red. Like that's really happening, right? They had a stunt man do the part where I'm run through the rails. That was the only stunt man part. But there's another part. Um, <laughs> and it, it's not one of the little kids. I think it's DJ or race they, where they slip on the oil and they fall on me and you can see yes. the, that that was a for real. He really he really fell on me. But yeah, when they were doing all their kicking and all their hitting and stuff, when they when you're a kid, you're you're trained to like go and do that at a karate class. You're not a stunt man trained to pull your punches. So they were actually hitting us. We went to the producers, which is a whole other story. There's a great story behind the producers of Three Ninjas, because they were the short version of it is is the producer is a guy named Director Sheen, and Director Sheen was a South Korean director who was kidnapped by North Korea, by Kim Il-sung, to make movies and was held captive for 20 years until he uh, escaped, like crawling through the marsh and getting into a boat and escaping with his wife, coming to America, and the first movie he makes is Ninja Kids. So it's like this whole crazy movie <laughs> story behind the movie. But we go to the movie, we go to the producers, and we go, look, the kids are hitting us, and they're like, okay. Like they could care less because it was, you know, it's just they're so used to like making movies like this in Asia where everyone gets hurt. It's just part of the process. So don't worry about it. Wow. Wow. That's that's crazy. So you now the great late Victor Wong, you don't you guys don't have a scene together, but did you get a chance to talk to him or meet him? Yes. Oh my God. So many. And we had we, we were hanging out on the set and I just He's in so many good movies. I was such a huge fan of there's some, the um, Big, Big Trouble, Trouble in China? China. Yeah. Yes. And I just couldn't shut up about it. And he asked me to. He goes, Patrick, enough. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. That's a good impression of him, too. Oh, my gosh. Because he was, he was in Big Trouble in China. He was in The Golden Child. Yep. He was in a bunch of stuff. Well, man. What was, I mean, aside from them not pulling their punches, what was it like working with Max and Michael and Chad? Well, they were good kids. I mean, they were really, they were excited to be there. A lot of times when you work with kids in this business, they're one of a couple of different versions. There's the jaded kid who's been in everything and they could care less. There's the kid who's never been in anything and are, don't know what to do. And then there was kind of this group of kids where they'd done a couple of things. They were excited to be there. They were really trying hard. And, you know, as I think DJ says, they're pretty nice kids. You know, it's like yeah. they were nice kids, and which helps a lot. It also helps that, you know, John Turtletop talking about directors um, with Michael Landon. Uh, Turtletop was another guy. He led a very good set because he was very good at what he did. He was funny. So he was always coming up with good ideas. And people would look forward to that. And he was very, not childlike, but very good with children mm -hmm. and allowed them to be kids and knew what would make them laugh. And like, like you know, calling all cars, calling all cars. That <laughs> came from John, um, you know, mom and dad's room, like came from John. Like he knew how kids kind of thought about how it would be. And what's so funny, just side note, um, there's a thing called looping where all the other incidental voices that you hear in a movie are looped, you know, like yeah. all the fight scenes where there's like, uh, ah, uh, ah, Hey, every one of those scenes that was looped or that had fight scenes was John and I in a looping room for about a day, just making wow. all the sounds. 
There's a there's a radio show that we hear at the very beginning when they're getting ready to go to school. That's me and John. Um, just like just it was what was great about it was the movie itself was an independent movie. It was a low budget movie. They were yeah, yeah. doing with not a lot of money, and then they were bought by Disney. And because it was bought, I think it was made for like two million dollars, and it made like thirty five million. Right. Percentage wise, it was the most profitable film of that year, which I. I, I was blown away by. Now, I'm I'm very surprised that I don't know if you have any information on this or not, but I'm surprised there wasn't a lot of merchandise with it. There were no toys. There were now there was a video game. Um right. oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. But there was a video game for the second movie, I'm sorry, but but no toys and nothing, which I'm really surprised by. But it it definitely has a cult following like kids, like us uh, like there people get tattoos of the mask and and everything. It's pretty it's pretty awesome. I'm I'm Generation X, okay. And which I like, to, well, I like to call us like the um, the 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 Saturday morning cereal generation. Like we 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 read the back of the cereal boxes, we scrounge and scrape for information. Where now it's at the you know tips of your fingers. So yeah. I will, I, I swear, I will never forget this. You know, Saturday morning block X Men, and then of course Spider Man comes on, right? And yeah. like I would always read the in the end credits, right? And so. Uh -huh. I'm I'm you know watching the episode and then at the end credits I'm like you know Christopher Daniel Barnes is Spider Man then your name pops up and I'm like wait a minute I know that and I'm like oh my gosh it's Fester how did you get the part <laughs> of Flash Thompson in Spider Man 1990? Um, it's probably my most exciting job because I'm a big huge comic book fan and Spider Man and Captain America are my favorites and I really really love Spider Man and so I auditioned. Uh, for spider-man actually i went in and i read peter parker spider-man and then about a month later i get a call from my agent saying that i've been cast and i'm freaking out and he goes as flash and i was still excited but i was bummed that i didn't get you know spider-man <clears throat> chris did a great job and i you know that's the best thing that can happen if you're an actor mm -hmm. if the guy that gets the part does a really good job because if the guy that gets the part does a shit at your sorry stupid job bad job then you're like, well, I did better than that. Like, why did I get it? Um, but he did a great job. And I was so thrilled to get it because they had so many big actors on the show. I mean, uh, the, uh, Mark Hamill played the Hobgoblin. And so I'm yeah. sitting there working with Mark Hamill. And the guy named Percy Rodriguez played the Kingpin. And uh, uh, who played uh, J. Jonah Jameson? Ed Asner? Ed Asner, yeah. Ed Asner's playing you know so working on spider-man it was fantastic because all of all the people that were you know playing all the different characters jennifer hale played um uh mary jane mary jane thank you i'm, I'm losing all of my my names because i'm old uh and she's this huge voiceover actress that's been in a thousand things and she's super great and super talented chris was great and it was just it was a blast being a part of this whole thing which I had been watching the uh, the X Men show again as a comic book fan, which is so excited for the new show coming out. Oh yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Oh, and by the way, inside tip: uh, I auditioned for the new X Men show, and apparently, apparently, and this is like I hate saying this because it sounds like such the actor thing, but apparently, I was this close to being Professor X, uh, which I wow. did not, of course. But I got the greatest compliment. They said, you know, you're in consideration and, you know, you did a great job with the read and blah, blah, blah. And we will let you know. So, but it was like just the excitement of being able to, you know, to be, to be a part of that. But with, with Spider-Man, it was the same thing. And to be honest, it was one of the things we did back in the nineties. And then because of no Disney plus, no, this, no, that, it just sort of went away and I didn't know what happened to it. And the guy that runs the show, uh, Semper, John Semper, John Semper Jr., he calls me and he says, hey, do you want to do LA Comic Con? And I'm like, okay. So we go and there's this big, huge panel for this show back in the early 2000s, that, which everyone was like, oh my gosh, it's this huge thing now. And we had no idea. But yeah, I love being in that show. And since he's kind of appeared in one of the movies, now it's the MCU, I officially get to say I'm, I'm officially part of the MCU in one of the, you know, universes <laughs> that are out there isn't it incredible like okay you know as well as i do like you know back in the day you know uh 
you know, you know, Spider Man was always the crown jewel when it comes to comic books and especially Marvel. But mm-hmm. now it's just so mainstream and so huge now. You know, I watched Into the Spider Verse a number of times. You know, and it's so yeah, amazing to really see how far. Movies. Yeah, it's amazing to see how big it is. Now. I can't believe I can't believe this. That this, you, this is how much of how much like you've been a part of my childhood. A, a lot aside from Three Ninjas and then Spider Man. I'm just learning that you did the voiceover work for the WB, like the promo stuff. Yeah. I was the comedy promo guy, so I announced all of the Jamie Foxx show. Uh, wow. Parenthood, Wayans Brothers. Coming up next on the way, and Sean and Marlon get into some trouble that you'll never believe. And Whoa. Yeah, it was a blast. That was a great job because it was about a block from my house. I'd go in, I'd read a bunch of promos, and I got to see all these shows. And like all of those shows, you know, like there was Simon with Jason Bateman and mm-hmm. uh, with uh, Kirk uh, uh, uh Oh, what's his name? Kirk, Kirk Cameron. Cameron. Kirk Cameron. Um, and like, of course, Jamie Foxx. I mean, Jamie Foxx is a huge star. And then it was he was basically doing Faulty Towers as a version of that. And he was a freaking great guy. He would come in every now and again when we would be doing the recordings of the promos and just do characters and stuff and then leave just like randomly because it was all on the same lot on the Warner Brothers back lot. Is, it's called The Ranch. And they would wow. shoot that there, and they would shoot the Parenthood, and they would shoot um, "Unhappily Ever After." And uh, I don't know what I think the Wayans was also on there. Wow! So hold on, I want people to re- realize like how big of a deal when the WB first came about. That was a huge thing, you know. And oh my gosh! So wait, so you so you said that "Unhappily Ever After." So that means that you possibly ran into Nikki Cox, who was like one of my biggest crushes back in the day. <laughs> yeah. No, Nikki was a sweetheart or is a sweetheart. I actually did a guy, I think he ended up marrying a John Van Eric or in on on the show Nikki. The guy who played her wrestler husband was on Jag, and I worked with him. I worked with Bobcat, which I know she's married to. I worked right, with Bobcat right, yeah. on Living Single. And um it was, I mean, it was a great place. It was a great time because it was a brand new network. For those of you who don't know, the WB was the Warner Brothers Network. Uh, UPN United Paramount Network started at the same time mm-hmm. and then when both of them were kind of like you know what we need to like team up they teamed up and got rid of both of their names and then became the CW for right. CBS which was the Paramount part and W for the Warner Brothers part and then they were able to be that network that everyone watched for the superhero show and Riverdale and all that stuff until um, Paramount or Warner Brothers was sold and they they wanted to get rid of the CW. They wanted to get rid of it because it wasn't making any money. And so that's kind of where where all that went. But I thought the WB itself was a great network, a great branded network. They had Mm -hmm. a great idea behind it. And we had a lot of fun doing those promos. We would do hundreds of promos a week. It was a lot. Believe this. You also did the DiGiorno pizza (laughs) voiceover stuff, right? Is Is that right? Yeah. If it's not delivery, it's DiGiorno. That's me in oh any commercial that you might hear. But what the weird part was, and like I, I talk about it in this TikTok, it was the easiest job I've ever got and the most profitable for the amount of work that went in because I went to a studio, which is different than just an audition. And sometimes they'll aud- they will audition you at a studio. And when you audition at a studio, the recordings are so pristine that they can use them if they want. And so I went in, they said, give us A, B, and C on, you know, it's not delivery, it's DiGiorno. And I did. I, I did. I said it three times. And then they called, you know, again, about a month later saying, okay, they hired you for DiGiorno. And so they put those those words, if it's not delivery, it's DiGiorno, after all these different commercials, and I never had to do it again. Sometimes I'd go in and I'd read for the, uh, if there was a longer piece of copy, you know, if you're looking for wonderful, delicious, cheese-stretching <laughs> pizza, try DiGiorno. And if they wanted to add some of that. But yeah, that was for about 10 years. And it was really, wow. really a wonderful job. Never again will I ever get a job as good as that. That is for sure. No, no. And not to get in your business, like with something like that, um, do you... Do you still get residuals? Because they still can, they can still use your voice, right? 
they can, how it works with, for commercials is what they call cycles and they go in 13 week chunks and you get paid out. Uh, they pay you a certain money, a certain amount of money based on your contract for 13 weeks. And then they can use that commercial anywhere they want for however many times they want for 13 weeks. And so right now they haven't paid me. So, because it's years later, so no, they couldn't put it on. If they wanted to put it on, they'd have to come to me first and say, we're going to put these back on. Here's your rate. Here's your payment. Now we can go and play them again. Uh, the reason I asked, another reason I asked that is because I was um, listening to a podcast with um, voice actor. His name is Carlos Al Alaraki. Um, he did the voice Carlos. of the Taco Bell dog. Yeah. And so. Yo quiero um, Taco Bell. Yeah, yeah he's, Taco he was Bell, also on so Jam. I worked with him as an on-camera guy. Really? I think he's with my same agency. Yeah, he, I've seen him a ton. He's really talented. He's done a lot of voices too. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, uh, that's the reason I asked that because there was a, they were talking about that on the podcast about you know them still using his voice and you know residuals and things like that. Um, now I want to know about the workers after school. I've I've seen a in, in if I really encourage people to take a uh, visit your Instagram because you tell a lot of great stories. You know what I'm saying? And you have such a warm voice; it's so easy to listen to. So, um, but I wanted to know more about the Workers Actor School. Um, can you tell us about it? Yeah, thanks, man. It's workingactorsschool.com. And the basic idea behind it was I've been to a lot of different acting classes. And most of them, for the most part, are what I call a studio class. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that you're in a black box theater. Everything is quiet. You're... Um, <laughs> Your teacher has got a scarf wrapped around their neck to protect their vocal, you know, and they're they're sipping tea and you're talking about acting and how acting is awesome. And you do your scene and it's like, dig deeper into your, you know, and it's a very quiet internal type of process in some of these acting classes where it's all about theory. Workingactorschool.com is all about what's it like to be a working actor? When you're on a set and the sun is setting and you only have 10 minutes to get your close up and it's your big speech and they don't have time to rehearse. So you're only going to get one take at it. How do you manage your emotions? How do you manage your work ethic? How do you manage all of the stress and the ability to break down a script, understand what you're needed for, what's your part in the in the process and how to get the most out of your camera time when you are a working actor. And so it's based on being in the situation of, you know, what's it like actually to work on a set? We talk a lot about set etiquette, how to behave with your, you know, with your fellow people that you're working with, all these type of things that I just never found in a studio style acting class. I like them both, but this one, the Working Actors School, is all about uh, what it's like to work, how to get work, you know, how to break down a script. We're starting a new class in um, very soon in March. Um, I don't know when this is going to air, but it's like we always have classes going, and they go from the very beginning to an acting master's class where we are kind of like a studio class where we just deal with working on characters and characterizations. But the majority of the class is based on wanting to know if you've never been to a set, what's it like? Everything is taught online, just on Zoom, just like we're doing here. And I've been so surprised at how much is able to get through when you're working with someone on Zoom. I mean, it's a minute, been amazing. Mm -hmm. I also have youth classes. Every Tuesday, we have a, a weekly class for kids, and they're great. In fact, some of the kids are greater than some of the adults that I've had go through the school. Cool, cool, man. Um, now, would that include like a? Do you have lessons for voice acting, or is that something that that you don't teach? Yeah, I, uh, there's also the main classes are act uh, adult basic, adult intermediate, and adult advanced. It's kind of like a whole program where you take them one at a time. There's a voiceover, which has a basic, intermediate, and advanced, and then a youth version. So we deal with the voiceover, we deal with uh, acting, but the voiceover, there's a specific uh, curriculum. And, you know, we, we talk about mic technique and character creation and the difference between animation and acting and all those different types of things. Fantastic. And um, how can people learn more about it? Uh, you, you have a website, right? Yeah, workingactorsschool.com. 
And if there's anyone else out there who is a fan who also like Little House or Jag and wants to get an autographed photo, there's a store area where you can also order those there. But that's it's all part of the same website, which is workingactorschool.com. Fantastic. Uh, real quick, I just got to say this. Yeah. I, I, I was listening to listening to one of your stories, and I'm telling you, this blew my mind. I was raised on the love boat, okay? <laughs> all this time, I didn't know it was a soundstage. I thought you guys were actually on a boat. And then when you go out there on the deck, that's a projection, right? It's not, it's not green screen, right. of course, because there wasn't a green screen back then. But this, it's a projection, a projection on video, right? What it was, yeah. First of all, what they did, and this is why I think people are confused or why they were why they were fooled for so long. Every now and again, maybe once or twice a season, so they had, what, 10 seasons, so maybe only 10 episodes, they would go on a real cruise and shoot on a real cruise ship. And then they would mix in some of that footage with the stuff that they were shooting in the soundstage. But they had a full Lido deck built on the soundstage. And then what they would do is there was no green screen or compositing. There was, but it wasn't for TV. And so what they would use is a thing called rear projection, where they'd put a screen up behind you. And then behind that screen, they'd put a projector and project what they wanted. And then the projector's shutter speed was timed to the camera that was shooting you their shutter speed so that there would be no flicker. So it would just look right. like what was happening behind you was really happening. And I got to say, you know, with green screen, obviously it's literally that it's a green screen. You're picturing everything with rear projection. You see it. So in the video I was saying, and it's true, it felt real. And what I didn't talk about was they had these little fans off the side of the cameras to give a little bit of an air type of feel. So there was an air breeze blowing through your hair. You could see the ocean. It was like for real. Wow. Wow. That's that that's crazy. That's really I ask you about this. You work with one of my favorite speaking of the love boat, because like one of my favorite movies is Sister Act Two. And there's uh -huh. a part where Alana Eubank says, the love boat soon will be making another run. And she's like one of my favorite actresses because she was in this movie called Waiting. And you worked uh -huh. with her and Scott Bayo on this show. So what was it like working with both of those people? Well, Alana's amazing. Alana is one of those people that has been in the business probably longer than I have. If she was older than I am, but she's not. She's probably been in it since she was a kid, just like me. Um, Alana on our show played a mom in the sitcom and in the sitcom format, usually the mom and the wife are the smart one and they look down on the dad and like shake their head like, you're such an idiot. And that's a lot where the comedy comes from. And in our show, See Dad Run, we wanted it to be where the, the father who was an actor was coming home from his TV show of 10 years, thinking that he was his great dad, but realizing that he didn't really know how to raise his kids. He knew how to raise TV kids, but not real kids. And so when we were casting, we kept seeing all these people come in and read with the attitude of like, he's such an idiot. And Alana came in with like, oh, I love him. He's so, bless his heart. He's so great. But no, honey, that's not how you do it. And it was a, a take on the character that we love. My wife and I, Tina Albanese, and I created this show. And she was always our secret weapon. You know, um, in fact, in the show, she plays a soap opera star who is married to this old guy named the Colonel. And the Colonel was played by Bernie Coppell from Love Boat. From, he played Doc. Wow. And when our son was in um, uh, Little League, Bernie Coppell had a son in Little League, even though he's much older. And we we got we were there sitting there on the bleachers. And I saw Bernie Coppell and I go, oh, I got to say hi to him. But he'll never remember me because it was like a kid. So I go over and I go, excuse me, Mr. Coppell. He goes, Mr. Coppell, Patrick, what are you doing? He totally remembered who I was. He was a That's sweetheart so cool. of a guy. Anyway, so he plays Alana's husband in the soap opera. Um, and she was just, she was always game for everything and always was super talented, always came in with a great idea, is, I think, one of the most underrated actors in town right now, bar none. I mean, she's yeah. so, like, she's in everything. And you, I think why she's underrated is she's not known because she never looked the same in anything she does. She's in, um, you know, the Reese Witherspoon movies. She's in... 
uh, a movie about Fox News. She's all over the place. She was in the Brady Bunch, uh, the the movies of the Brady Bunch. And it's like, you just never know. Oh, oh, that's Alana. Oh, there's Alana. She's mm-hmm. wonderful. Yeah, very, very much a chameleon, man, because she's in the new um the new Ted series. Um, um, right. You know, Seth MacFarlane's thing. Um, he, she was in um Euphoria. She was in Euphoria as well. Wow. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Yeah, it just makes sense. She's in everything. You're lucky to get her. Yes. Um, but um, how can fans reach you? Uh, through workingactorschool.com. You can also email me at workingactorschool at gmail.com. Uh, you can check out TikTok at Working Actors School. Uh, 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 what's the other one? Uh, Instagram. Instagram. And uh, yeah, I put up videos every day. And I, I'm having a blast. They're really fun to tell these stories that, you know, my family's tired of hearing them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not tired. Of, I'm I'm definitely not tired of hearing them. Hearing them. I, I've learned so much, especially um, the love boat. And, and then like... Um, there was another one. Uh, oh, the one you were talking about, where um, Little House and Perry won, and they won. I think it was an Emmy, and you went on stage and you were like, oh, <laughs> "The People's know. Choice Awards, yeah, People's People Choice, Choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah." Find these things on the internet, and I'll go. Oh, I forgot I did that, and then I'm like, "Why did I do that?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's 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 keep on doing what you're doing. I really love what you're doing, and um, this whole podcast is about giving a person their flowers. Thank you for being a part of my childhood. Thank you for being part of so many great things. Keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you for your time today. And um, it's been a pleasure, man. It's really, it is really has made oh, my man, day. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I do appreciate it. And uh, good luck with your podcast. And yeah, man, just that's the whole secret of this, of this business is just do it. And that's nowadays what you can do. We can do these things now where, you know, you can, I don't know where you are, but I'm sitting in my second bedroom. And I'm making videos and that's what happens. It's just yeah. anyone can do it now. So good job for you. Thank you. I'm in my bedroom too. It's it's so crazy to think about because like all of this stuff that we're doing right now with our technology, Back to the Future 2 kind of predicted it. <laughs> right. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, um, thank you again for your time and I appreciate you so much. You got it. <laughs>